I, I would say the biggest challenge for me um, is giving the audience room and time, whether it's on the page or on a podcast or on the show or on stage, giving them room or time to, to let the story sink in and, and follow the narrative. Uh, I think fast and talk fast. And sometimes I rush the story because I know how it ends. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the show. You're listening to the Storytellers Network. I'm so glad you're joining me today. I am excited about today's guest as I am for every guest because I talk to amazing storytellers. I cannot wait for you to hear all of this guy's stories. Uh, before we get there real quick, the storytellersnetwork.com is the website. Go there for past episodes with other terrific storytellers. Subscribe, get on the email list there. Uh, when you hit that subscribe button, it'll take you to a, to a page. You can find us on uh, Apple Podcasts. You can find us in Stitcher. You can find us on Spotify. And you can just simply get emails from us as well and sign up there. So, so do that. You can also hit the contact page and uh, send me an email. So that's that information. So let's get to our guest today. Uh, Jay Bear is my guest today for Business Storytellers. Jay co-wrote Talk Triggers with Daniel Lemon. He's also written Utilities, Hug Your Haters. Jay Run is the, the founder of Convince and Convert, runs that. Just a good guy, a great storyteller, a master speaker as well. I've seen Jay speak, and I've seen video of him in, in more recent years. Incredible storyteller. So you're going to hear a lot. You're going to learn a lot. I think you'll be inspired, and we just have a really good time. So without further ado, let's get to Jay's stories. <music> So Jay, thanks for joining the Storytellers Network tonight to have a little conversation. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. I don't know that you and I constitute a network, but hopefully there's other people out there to uh, you know make it, make it more of a community. It's the one-on-one network, but we'll take it. That's right. Absolutely. Well, hopefully the listeners are, are maybe the network. Yes, listeners, get on it. There might be two or three of those anyway. Um, uh, millions, a million. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to the show. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. We've I've been kind of on on the outskirts of your world for many years. Uh, I was fortunate to be on Convince and Convert, uh, your, your podcast. Yeah. Media, social pros, right? Social, social pros, yep. Uh, way back in the day. So yeah. this is really exciting for me. Um, I, just did a, I just did a show to, uh, a couple hours ago, episode 365. Oh my goodness. That's incredible. Yeah. That's one day. That's every, that's a whole year. Although yeah. it's, it's weekly, right? So it's not, that's it's a weekly, lot. Yeah, it's, it's actually, <laughs> it's almost nine years now. That's shows. incredible. Plus uh, you're doing your talk triggers show now too. Yeah, which is also weekly. Yep. Yeah, yep. which I love. Um, Thank you. And I like that little bite-sized bit. So, uh, so, so you in my intro, I mentioned Talk Triggers is your latest book. Yeah, uh, you've been doing a lot a long time, but Talk Triggers is, is the newest one. And man, incredible! Really enjoyed your and Daniel's Thanks. writing. Have you always been a storyteller? I think so. Uh, you know, you, you don't know what that is or why that's different or important, you know, until much later in life. But even as a kid, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when I was a freshman, uh, I started in journalism and I just loved it, man. Like just, just, you know, running around the school and interviewing people and figuring out what was going on. And, and I became the uh, editor of the school paper uh, for two years. And, and uh, we really took it up some places, won a bunch of awards and, uh, you know, I had a whole column there as the editor and I'd write about issues they cared about, uh, at the school. And, um, at the same time I started doing more storytelling kind of on stage, although I didn't think that's what it was. And uh, I was terrible on drama. I'm so bad as an actor or that's why people are like, do more voices. I'm like, no, nah, dude, I don't, I don't do karaoke and I don't do voices. Uh, but I was always like the MC or the host of everything. Mm -hmm. Even when I was like a sophomore, so like 15, right? Like, well, who knew, who will host the talent show? Jay will do it. He doesn't care. He's not scared of a microphone, right? So, uh, yeah, I think, I think from a long time, and actually, fun fact, uh, maybe not fun, fun to me, but that was my plan when I graduated high school. Uh, I was a journalism major, initially in college, and my idea was to be sort of an investigative reporter, investigative journalist. That, that's what I wanted to do uh, for a career. And then 
uh, I realized uh, a short time later that I did not want to do that and uh, went in another yeah. direction. But that was the, that was the plan for a long time. And no, no slight against the journalists that are out there because I think no. journalists can be amazing storytellers. But aren't you glad you didn't go into investigative journalism in today's day and age? Boy, I tell you, I think I probably could have had a run uh, for a bit, but but right now uh, it's it's a tough tough deal, man. It's it is. Uh, I feel terrible too because it's such an incredibly important role for for humanity right that that somebody's telling stories right uh and just from an economic uh, viability standpoint it's uh it's rough out there yeah it is um why do you think we love stories so much what does what does story mean to you i think there's two pieces to that um one you know a good story is is enjoyable to hear right so so there is a personal pleasure component to the receipt of a story and then it's been proven time and time and time again uh, that that stories are the best way to convey information to to anybody, right? And and that goes all the way back to uh, the days before we had any other option, right? The 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 use of storytelling and the spoken word to pass down knowledge uh, is incredibly important and goes back to to the cavemen days, really. Uh, you know, I was um, uh, in Mexico recently, and and you know, you think about the churches there and really any old churches anywhere, you know, nobody could read. So all it was is a series of stained glass panes and they told stories using the stained glass to illustrate the points, right? It's an illustrated manuscript, but in glass, mm. you know, back to the times of, of Beowulf and the spoken word tradition, like all of that stuff goes back truly millennia. And, and even today with all the things we have video and social and et cetera, et cetera, a story well told is, is still the best way to, uh, to, to, to convey information and the most memorable and that's scientifically proven. That's facts, baby. Yeah. I, and you know, like, it's funny cause I'm, as I'm thinking the, you know, stained glass and those pictographs and that kind of thing. Yeah. That's where we are today with emoji and Instagram. Right. Isn't it true? It's so funny you say that. I had a conversation like that the other day with somebody and I was saying, you know, it's like the whole deal has gone full circle, right? We, we went from, you know, from cave drawings uh, to emojis with a bunch of other crap in between, but we're like right back where we started from yeah. and, and everything is so uh, visual now. I actually wonder, and I say this with only a small degree of facetiousness, you know, I wonder 10 years from now, whether we'll still have keyboards, whether, whether this machine will have a keyboard um, right. or they'll be so driven by, by voice activation and AR and other things that it, it'll just be a screen. Yeah. Well, and, and even monitors, right? Like I have my, my monitors right. in front of me, but we could yeah. have, I mean, Google Glass kind of ruined it for a moment there, but right. wearables right. that when right. I look this way, there's a screen. When I look yeah. this way, there's a, so like it could, be, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. It's the technology. So how is technology changing this craft of storytelling for you? Well, I mean, I, I think the most obvious answer is that it is shortening the length of the story, right? Because everybody has a, uh, a modern attention span now um, until you suck them in, right? Once you suck them in, they'll binge Game of Thrones. They'll, they'll spend 60 hours doing it, but you got to suck them in first. Um, and, and so one of the things that I am disproportionately good at, and I don't know why, but it is, is that I can, especially on stage, kind of do a presentation that's more or less a series of tweets, right? It's, it's, a, it's a collection of sort of, it's a collection of statements and each of them are tweetable. I sort of taught myself how to do that when, when uh, Twitter first came out and I was starting to study to speak. Uh, and you would never, ever think about giving a talk like that. You know, a lot of my buddies are, are speakers who are older and, and how they go about the craft is so different than how I go about it just because the eras in which we came up as speakers. Um, as you mentioned, I've got a, a new show now called Talk Triggers, which is a short video series, seven minutes, right? Seven minute episode. Would I've done a seven minute episode of that show, you know, 10 years ago? No, no, I wouldn't have because it wouldn't make any sense. Like, why would you do a seven minute show? Uh, so, so that's the most obvious answer is it's got to be um, shorter. And then the second, I think, most obvious answer is that insofar as it's online, uh, doing it in multiple modalities uh, because people prefer different ways to take a story now. Some people prefer to read. Some people prefer to listen. Some people prefer to watch. Some people go back and forth and switch horses. And so my take is, I was like, if you're going to tell a story, you might as well tell it in a bunch of different ways so people can pick. So do you feel like as storytellers, and especially in this season of business storytellers, so maybe brands or people doing that kind of thing, Yeah. It, do you, do you kind of have to be everywhere or can you pick a couple and get good at them and improve or do uh, I just, like it's overwhelming, right? I got to be everywhere. 
I don't think you have to be everywhere in terms of all the different social networks and stuff. I, I mostly am, but I, I kind of do this for a living, right? Sure, yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to be like a digital marketing consultant and not have an Instagram account or whatever. It just, it just be a little weird. Yeah. But, but the way I do it with, with my new show is, yeah, it's everywhere, but it, it's, it's everywhere as, as a cascade, not a different production. So I shoot the show uh, on uh, you know, my video camera here at home. Uh, I do light edit on it. I send it out to my team. They do some additional edits and it starts out as a video, right? It, it is a native video for YouTube. But then we strip out the audio, and now it's a podcast for those who prefer to listen uh, in the car or while working out. And then we transcribe it, and then it's a blog post and an article on Medium and an article on LinkedIn. And so now it's a written piece of content for somebody who prefers that format. So yeah, I'm in a bunch of different places with that show, but I don't feel like it's a tremendous amount of work uh, to, to, to cross-pollinate it that way, which is uh, a blessing. Yeah. And, and do you... So it might be a leading question. So forgive me, counselor. Um, do, do you test out those things to see which one you should spend more of your time in? Like with talk triggers, did yeah. you go after YouTube because you thought this is where it's going to really take off? No, no, I didn't. Um, we always, and this is true for my stuff and also for our clients at Convince to Convert, we always suggest starting with video. That if you're going to tell stories, start with video. Only because if you have video, you have audio. And if you have audio, you have print. You just have to clean it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to go the other direction. Like if you've got a great article, making a video out of that is a whole separate thing. But if video is always the mother of sauce, right? It's the seed corn, then, then getting to the other stuff is a piece of cake. Doesn't work the other way around. So we tell everybody, even if you're not gonna use the video, start with video because maybe you just use the video to create teaser graphics or something else. But, but video first is kind of our uh, philosophy. So video could, could lead to, as you said, audio, text, infographics, tweetable right. moments or whatever. So yeah, for each, each seven minute episode, six, seven minutes of my show, let's see, uh, we create now 14 pieces of content. Wow. Okay. A seven minute show every time, every week. Uh, so you just got to get, you know, you kind of get, got to get your system right. And once you have the system, it's a, yeah, you know. yeah, absolutely. And so for those, for those watching the video, talk triggers is what we're talking about. There's a yeah. look at it. Um, what a great set of stories. Speaking of storytellers, um, how do you gather those stories and yeah. then figure out how to share them? Cause like I imagine, so I'm, I'm going to start, start this. Uh, I imagine you probably get a ton of stuff. And some of them are great, but then you have to be able to weave them in with each other or make a point out of them. Yeah. How do you do that with this, yeah. all this content? So a talk trigger is a strategic operational differentiator that you employ to create customer conversations. So it's essentially doing word of mouth on purpose. And most people don't, they just try and do word of mouth on accident. Uh, and the book is a whole system for how to create a word of mouth strategy for a business or an individual, how, how to do something that customers will notice and talk about it and that gets you new customers. So in the book, there's a ton of different case studies about different types of businesses. Um, a lot of those I already knew about some, what we just sort of discovered and were sent to us. Um, and we just organized them to kind of fit the, the thesis um, of the book and the structure, the system, the planning formula that we developed. Uh, now, because I'm out there a lot talking about these things and, and conversational customer experiences, you're right. People send me new ideas all the time, uh, which is great. And some of them are better than others. But what really helps is because the, the, the talk trigger system, and it really is a system, mm -hmm. dictates that, that a word of mouth strategy uh, includes these four things and is one or more of these five categories we've identified, it's pretty easy to sort of say, does this meet the test? And if it meets the test, then great. Then I'll probably tell that story at some point. I've got 47 episodes of the show planned. Uh, I have uh, 13 produced, right? So I've got a whole year worth of case studies already locked, uh, which is really cool. So I don't have, I'm never, it's never like, oh my God, what am I talking about this week? It's like, okay, I know on October 3rd what the show is, uh, unless something better comes along and it gets bumped. But So that's kind of nice. Um, and I've never had that before in my career ever <laughs> with that kind yeah. of like, you know, database already set, but it is really fun to have that much raw, that much raw material. Uh, and what I try to do, uh, Dan is, is again, kind of cross pollinate between things that I'm involved in. What I try to do, uh, is I'll, I'll learn a new one, right? I'll hear about a new case study 
and then I'll try it out on stage. So the next time I do a speech, I'll slip it in and see how it goes. Check the audience reaction. If the audience reaction is good, then I'll take it into the Talk Triggers weekly show and build it in as one of the case studies because then I know that it's got a little resonance. Yeah. So you have to, I guess, always kind of be thinking on two sides of your brain as you're giving that presentation and you're gauging at the same time so that you can plan the next use of it. That, yep. man, that, that seems complicated. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, this is not the subject of the show necessarily, but um, right. anybody who, who does a lot of speaking will tell you this. Um, and I can't really describe it very well, but I'm just going to tell you what it feels like and, and do with it what you will. When you're doing a, a presentation, you've done it a bunch of times, so you kind of know the mechanics of it. it. It's literally like you are in an out-of-body experience because you're giving the presentation and you know what's happening and you're watching the audience and you're planning your next thing. But then there's like a whole nother side of your brain, which at the same time is saying, okay, what sh should I say this differently? Should I change this up? That guy doesn't seem like he's paying attention. I should go over to that side of the room. It's, it's like a two track process. And uh, a lot of my friends who are speakers, Scott Stratton and a bunch of other people, we've had that conversation. And I never, it was never like that until I started to speak a lot. And now it's like that every time. So it mm. seems crazy that you could be sort of gauging audience reaction thoughtfully uh, and sort of essentially taking real time notes in your head while actually giving the speech, but that's exactly how it works. And really, I mean, you said it may not necessarily be the subject of the show, but it, but in a way, in my mind, it kind of is because storytelling is, can be writing, can be speaking from the stage. Gosh, I mean, storytellers listening, you have- yeah. A, a, a just untold number of ways to be a storyteller, especially nowadays. So go, you know, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's incredible. That's good advice. Well, one of the things that, that I really pay a lot of attention to as do a number of speakers is that, you know, just because you know the story and just because you can tell the story doesn't mean the story can't be told better. Mm -hmm. Like my, my goal is to be 1% better as a speaker every time I step on stage. And, and where I learned that is from comedians the, the amount of craft that they put into quite literally every sentence is amazing, right? They'll, they'll change one word. They'll add a one second pause. Uh, it, it is truly a science. And, and I think that's something that, that I want to convey that, yes, storytelling is an art, but, but telling the perfect story is also a science. And, and I, so similarly, I thought of it in a way of musicians, right? Yes. Um, David Meerman Scott and I have, had some conversations and he talks about it being a performance. He always wanted to be a rock star and he can't, yep. Yep. <laughs> it's a, it's a performance, but like you give that speech a little bit different each time, whether you go see, you know, Mumford and Sons or Metallica. Yeah. They're going to play songs a little differently each time. Cause you, you, you have to number one. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't do it exactly the same every time, nor is it very authentic for your audience if it's just yeah. like press play. So is it similar then as a professional speaker <laughs> thinking of it the same way? Definitely. That's certainly the way I think of it. And I think most other speakers. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so what is your favorite way to tell a story? Is it from the oh, stage? Oh, definitely on stage. Yeah, definitely on stage. Just because uh, you have so many options at your disposal, right? You've got a whole stage, you've got a microphone, uh, you're up on a platform, you've got lights, you've got props, you've got the audience there. It just, it, it gives you, um, certainly in my world, I'm not a rock star by any stretch of the imagination, um, I have no musical talent whatsoever, but uh, it, it gives you the most storytelling alternatives right there at your disposal. Mm -hmm. So I'd always prefer to tell a story on stage because there's just, you can, you can read the room. You can, you know, your creativity is, is, uh, has very few limits on it in, in that environment. So that's the best. Is there any, uh, similar way to do it digitally or is really from the stage truly the only way to, I mean, are, are Facebook lives at all similar because you can get reactions yeah, or not? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good, uh, a really good angle is, is Facebook live is great because you get the real time audience feedback. Um, that's, that's terrific. And, and you can also, you know, you can set the environment on a Facebook live to be similar to uh, a live presentation, just depending on how you set the camera and the, and the, you know, speakers and those kind of things. So yeah, I think that's probably uh, probably the second best way. Right on. So Jay, it sounds to me like storytelling is pretty easy for you. Uh, and everything's perfect. <laughs> it's not, none of those things are true at all. Uh, a little bit of facetious there. All. Uh, what, I, <laughs> what do you find is the biggest challenge in storytelling? Um, I don't figure out how to phrase this. I, I would say the biggest challenge for me um, is 
giving the audience room and time, whether it's on the page or on a podcast or on the show or on stage, giving them room or time to, to let the story sink in and, and follow the narrative. Uh, I think fast and talk fast. And sometimes I rush the story because I know how it ends. <laughs> and it's a bad habit and I have to consciously work at it to make sure that I, I give enough time for people to make sure they're like, what did he say five seconds ago? And then everything else is lost, right? Uh, and, and even, um, even when, I, when I write books, it's like, okay, let's make sure that we're adding enough color here that we're adding enough exposition in this case study so that people know kind of exactly what happened. That's the biggest challenge for me. Right on. So speaking of books, um, you co-wrote Talk Triggers with Daniel Lemon. Yeah. How does co-writing as a storyteller work for you? What's that yeah, like? It's, I've done it twice now. My first book was uh, also written with a co-author, Amber Nasland. Uh, we wrote The Now Revolution together. That one, in, in, in the first book, um, we sort of alternated chapters and sort of said, this is yours, this is mine. And it was fine, but Amber and I have pretty different voices as storytellers in writing. And so it, 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 it didn't hang together quite as well as we wanted it to. Learned some lessons, wrote one, two, three, four books uh, solo, and then worked on this project with Daniel. Uh, it's a little different because Daniel and I have worked together for a long time. He used to be the head of strategy at my firm, and he'd also written a prior book. And so it was a little easier this time, partially because he and I collectively really worked on all the stories. You know, we picked the stories and which case studies are we going to use? How is this story best told? So we, we kind of had alignment on, on the, on the shtick, if you will. And then we split up different chapters based on kind of who had the most passion for that chapter, who kind of had a better handle on the stories. Um, so it feels like one author, I think. I, 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 I'm hard pressed to see places where you're like, oh, that was Jay's chapter, that was Daniel's or whatever. So it feels better. But as you mentioned, um, you know, he does the talk trigger keynote speech, as do I. But we do it very differently. Like even though it's, it's you know, probably eh, 60, 70 percent of the same stories if he tells it versus I tell it. Um, the way we tell the stories and the way we construct the keynote is really different, different styles of speakers and just different ways of storytelling. So you can take the exact same material uh, and, and it becomes two totally different experiences. And do you find that having a partner like that really sharpens you and makes you better? Yeah, this time for sure, because I know what I'm not good at. Uh, and, and he's really good at that kind of the more linear process, uh, thinking and, and what we really wanted to make sure we had in this book is, is yeah, word of mouth is really important, more important than, you know, you got to get some of that for your business, but then here's exactly how to do that. Like here's an actual structure and a strategy and a process, uh, for doing that. And that's the stuff that he's really good at. So it was, uh, it made it a much, much better project. Right on. And, and I, I mean, I seriously, man, like no, no BS here. I read that blew my mind. Oh, thanks. It's, it's not like so new that you're like, where does yeah. it come from? You kind of go, well, yeah, no kidding, <laughs> which, is, which is awesome to do. Uh, blew my mind. I find myself quoting it often, telling people yeah, about thanks. it, nonprofits, just a ton of different ideas. Um, so thank you for that. And, and no, I appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, do you have a, I have a couple of kind of favorites, but do you have a favorite example that you love to go back to that well? Oh, man. Um, or maybe a couple. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I. One of the ones that I, I used to do a lot, and I also changed the stories in the speech a lot just because you get bored, right? I'm like, put in a different one, right? Just <laughs> more, more fun. Yeah. Um, the, the one I probably talk about the most because I think it describes the concept so neatly um, of, of doing something different on purpose to create conversation is Skip's Kitchen, which is the, the restaurant in Sacramento that when you order, uh, they whip out a deck of cards and they fan them out face down in front of you and they say, pick a card. And if you pick a joker, uh, your entire meal is free and people freak out. Right. And they like leave reviews and call their mom. It's like, it's like a whole thing. Uh, and it's a huge driver of their success. But I like telling that story and I tell it with more detail, of course, uh, on stage, uh, because it, 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 you're like, Oh, I get it. I understand what he's talking about now. I understand what a purposeful differentiator that creates conversation means. Uh, so I really like that one. It's probably the tightest one that we have. Like boom, boom, boom. Got it right? Yeah. It's, um, there's others that are really like way more crazy or, or uh, in some cases, you know, more robust in the telling, but, but that one uh, is, is a real light bulb one for a lot of people. And it makes me want to go visit that restaurant. Yes. Like I want to go. I've never been there. And I feel like I'm robbing myself. I learned, you talk about where we get them. So that one 
uh, was sent to me by my buddy DJ Waldo, who's a longtime social media digital marketing fixture, uh, and now is doing some other stuff. Um, but uh, we're good buddies, and and he knew what I was working on for the project. And he's like, hey, you know, he lives in Sacramento. He's like, you, you got, won't believe this. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. And he set me up with Skip and did the interview and all those things. So it's, it's nice when, um, uh, when, when people, uh, you know, feed you uh, opportunities. In fact, I owe that guy twice because uh, our current head of uh, strategy who replaced Daniel actually also was a referral from DJ Waldo. So now I've got my best uh, talk trigger story and our number one strategist. So uh, yeah, that guy's got to get something for Christmas maybe. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, it makes, it makes me want to go out west, man. Absolutely. So, so you said you interviewed Skip. Is that part of yeah. this? Like I wanted to ask, do you have to get permission to share these? People just send you something and you're like, sure, I'll just tell that story. Do you get permission to interview them and get the details? Uh, both. So okay. in many cases, we, we will interview them. So probably 75, 80% of the case studies in the book, we did interviews. There's some that we tried to get interviews and we couldn't or whatever. And so then we just documented it with references to, to published uh, interviews or other things that people have done. Um, you know, want to make sure it's accurate. Uh, but we could like uh, the Penn and Teller story in there. Penn and Teller is a case study in the book. Uh, about how they they go out in the lobby and meet every audience member after every single show in Vegas, like ten thousand shows in a row, or whatever. Uh, I talked to to uh, their agent and said, "Hey, we're doing this book. You want to talk? You know, we do an interview with the guys." And they just like, "No, nah, we don't have time." And they kind of blew it off, which is fine. Uh, I was able to find enough other interviews that they'd done with other people, and then to cite those, and then write the case study based on that. Gotcha. Yeah, it, it's funny because uh, I've got blown off a couple of times in my podcast and, and I get it. People are busy. I, I respect yeah. that. I prefer yeah. a no than a ghost. Like, you know, yeah. I, I want to interview. Yeah. What's going on? Did you get this? Are you, are you thinking right. about it? Yeah. Right. I want to, I want to interview Mike Rowe. Yeah. I, lo- I love his love that podcast, guy. man. Well, and as you probably know, uh, his podcast was the template for my talk trigger show. Okay. Uh, his, his show, that's the way I heard it. Yeah. Uh, the length, the format, and the fact that I don't tell you who the, who the business is till the very end is the same structure that he uses. He just does it way better than me. You, you do it very well, by the way. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. He, he is better, but you do it really. No, yeah, um, micro. I mean, I'm, I'm not <laughs> like, oh no, Dan thinks micro right. is better than me. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, micro is, is uh, one of my favorite uh, public personalities uh, in the world. Yeah. And, and he, you know, not, not right now. I'm too busy. I said, okay. His assistant did, but I was like, all right, at least you told me no. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't great. hurt to ask though. Right. That's great. Yep. Where do you, I think my, I think my show would be more like his actually. I'd, I'd steal it even more closely. Uh, if it was just a podcast because I'm starting with video, I've got to do it a little differently. In addition to not being as talented, yeah. uh, I've got to do it a little differently than, than what he does. Uh, and I've thought about doing it both ways, like actually doing a fully separate recording just for the podcast. But um, for now, while I'm doing the other show as well, uh, I'm going to keep doing it this way. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I like the idea of making it easy on, on the creator, you know, yeah. do the video and just use the audio. I mean, that's, yeah. See, and I, and I think about the podcast as audio first. I use the video cause it's YouTube and Google owns YouTube. So why not? Yeah, why not? Sure. But yeah. you know, so I, I think, so I, I, there's so many stories in, in touch triggers that I loved, but I think one of my favorite was the simple, uh, trim story where they put, call the guy for a t-shirt oh, call Kurt for a shirt yeah. call Kurt for a shirt I was like yeah that's yeah. genius yes that so. is they, they've won a bunch of awards like word of mouth marketing awards at Windsor yeah. one uh, the company's name is Windsor one uh, and they used to buy a bunch of magazine ads every year and realize it wasn't working <laughs> so now they put a stamp on the back of their boards they make wooden uh, high-end wooden trim boards right. like Wayne Scotting and you know crown molding and all that uh, and in the back of the board says uh, call Kurt for a shirt 888-229-7900. And you're like, what the hell is this? Right. And you, <laughs> I don't know. I'll give it a shot. And you call There's a real guy named Kurt. Mm. Uh, and he asked you, you know, how much you weigh and a bunch of other stuff. He's got to get you a shirt in the right size and, and all this, but he's the head of inside sales. And they have this whole conversation about what products you're using and what you could be using next day on the job site. It's mostly contractors or their customers. Next day, a FedEx box comes with your name on it, open it up t-shirt for you and all your crew. If you've got crew a uh, size for everybody, medium, large, XL, small. And then a sample of every product you discussed on the call in the box Man. and companies doubled in size. No, they don't spend any money on advertising. Uh, they're killing it. The biggest problem now is finding other guys named Kurt to answer the phone. <laughs> Right. right. Bit of an HR challenge. Yeah, you know, just, just call yourself Kurt. That's fine. Yeah, no. you could do that. Um, yeah, and, and it's cool because that's, I mean, it's B2B. That's mostly yeah. contractors, hey, well, right? 
Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Um, a lot of people, when you first start talking about uh, word of mouth and, and uh, conversational customer experience, if you will, people say, well, that's only for consumer companies. You know, they're kind of wild and wacky. They can do fun stuff like that, but it's actually the opposite. A, word of mouth has a greater impact on B2B than it does B2C because people don't buy stuff B2B unless they check with somebody else first. Hmm. And two, most B2B companies have sworn a vow to be as boring as possible. <laughs> so if you just do some one thing uh, with a little twist on it, uh, people are like, oh my God, this is the craziest thing ever, right? Yeah. And it has this huge impact. So it's one of my crusades is to get more and more B2B companies uh, employing talk triggers because it will definitely work. Yeah. Well, that's it. You know, when I read the book, I, I was at a company that is a, it's called marketing services, but we, they print a lot of stuff too. And yeah. so I went to them with it. Like some of my other, my, my colleagues was like, we have to all read this book. We got to figure out our talk trigger. We got to do this thing. Um, I've since left that, that company, but I still promote it. I'm like, you got to do this. Yeah. Cause that's, yeah. In the B2B world, you set yourself apart by doing just one little thing better. One little thing. One That's little awesome. thing was notice. Yeah. And, and my other one was because I have a family. It was the holiday world story. Oh man. That's, Tell that one. That's a great one. It is. And, and it's, uh, that is holiday world splash and safari, um, is a family owned water park and amusement park. It's just 91 miles, uh, that direction. Uh, they're in Southern Indiana in a town called Santa Claus, Indiana. It's actually called Santa Claus, Indiana, uh, which is weird because there's nothing there. Certainly not Santa Claus. Um, <laughs> It's in the middle of nowhere, like nothing there except for randomly uh, this family water park and amusement park. Uh, and they've got a bunch of strategic disadvantages. A, worst location ever. Uh, B, don't have a huge budget. C, they don't have any characters. Like they don't have a hook. They don't have Mickey Mouse or Harry Potter because, you know, it's family. owned. So they've got Christmas land and Thanksgiving land where gravy run, rolls in the streets. Um, <laughs> It's pretty crazy, but they're a really smart business. And they are the only company ever uh, to be mentioned in uh, three Jay Bear books. They've been a case study in three books in a row. That's in a different, in a different element of their business too, each time. Wow. Really? So they're in utility for their, uh, their amazing FAQ work. They're in hug your haters for their amazing customer service work. Uh, and now they're in talk triggers for their amazing word of mouth work. That's kind of amazing. Um, so the way it works uh, for their talk trigger is like, okay, we got to get people talking about us and have enough budget. And let me just say, I don't think I mentioned this in the book. I can't remember. One of my favorite sayings in business is from Robert Stevens, who's the uh, founder of Geek Squad, the services arm for Best Buy. This isn't a hundred percent true, but it's true enough, Dan. The quote is advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Yeah. If you can get your customers to become your storytellers, you don't have to spend very much money on advertising because your customers become your ads and the story becomes the ad. So the story at Hollywood One Slash and Safari is that they give you free soft drinks and free sunscreen to everybody. Totally free soft drinks, totally free sunscreen. I don't know if you've bought a soft drink in an amusement park anytime recently, but it's like sixteen thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, it's one bitcoin, so they charge you for a drink. It's like out of control. Yeah. These guys give it away for nothing, and sunscreen too. And and they have thousands of five star reviews on TripAdvisor or whatever. And they all mention soft drinks and and sunscreen. Like it's crazy. It, it's that's the story. That is the talk trigger. It's the quintessential talk trigger, uh, because without sunscreen and soda, it's just a pretty good amusement park uh, theme park in a really bad location. <laughs> And what I love about it too, is that it, like the things that I didn't, when I was, when I'm reading that story, I'm thinking, this is amazing. This is amazing. But the, the, the hook that got me was as a dad, the, the amount of joy that I will get by not having to say, okay, we're only gonna get one soda this time. Cause it's 20 bucks. We're all going to share it. Yeah. Then we're going to throw half of it away because we're in line. And like, yep. what a win for a dad or, or yep. a mom who is, has the checkbook, whatever. But yep. like, like, I don't want to be a cheap dad. <laughs> so right. And then the other thing is the environmental side of it that you talk about. Like, they left trash. Yeah. Smaller cups, they actually cups. use them. They drink everything. There's no liquid waste. Like just, and man. way less uh, admissions to the infirmary because people are hydrated and they're not sunburned. And before they start all this, they realized that like 80% of their kind of first aid was dehydration and sunburn. Like, well, we can fix two birds with one stone here. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So you've got a, a ton of stories, but do you have – an example of a story that changed your life in some way, professionally or personally? Uh, 
Well, it it's a story about me uh, in some ways, but yeah. Um, so my uh, best friend growing up, we were best friends since we were like two years old. No, that's not right. A little older than that, but still. Uh, best friends all the way through school. Such good friends that he married my wife's sister. Oh. So my best friend became my brother-in-law, which I totally recommend if you can, if you can, <laughs> if you can socially engineer that. It makes uh, holidays awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. Get on that. There's my tip. There you go. So uh, we were all living in downtown Phoenix uh, at this time. And when I was 30, he was 30. We were all 30 years old. Um, he called me one night and said, I just got diagnosed uh, with terminal brain cancer. And the next day, I walked in and quit my job. And I have not worked for anybody since. And that was 19 years ago. Um, so that absolutely changed my life. We unfortunately lost him a couple years later. Um, but you know, I'd wanted to start my own business uh, much earlier. In fact, I'm a seventh generation entrepreneur. So in my family, it's not really a question of whether you're going to be an entrepreneur. It's when and in what context. Yeah. But I was 30 and I thought I was going to do it when I was like 23, but I kept not doing it because I was scared, right? I was like scared of failure and what if it doesn't work out and I've got a wife and, and you know, I was getting paid pretty decent to be like a digital consultant or whatever. But he called me and that was it. And I'm like, what am I scared about? Like, you know, if this doesn't work out, let's go get another job. Uh, and, uh, that, that changed everything from, from that day until this day. And looking back that far, so, so, you know, thank goodness for him, like what an incredible story. And looking back that far, you surrounded yourself then too, with people doing similar things from what I understand. I've talked to other folks and I've heard these names thrown around. How important is it to have not only that inspiration of your brother-in-law slash best friend, but then that that circle of people around you the like for you the joe Polizzi's, the ann handley's you know the scott monies the scott stratton's mm -hmm. gosh now you all are like idols in this world in a way i mean heroes famous people whatever you want to call it right you made you all made it a, a pretty good impact it made it made a good work impact but you all have names now back then did you know that it was going to happen did you look around and go these we're all going to make it no definitely not yeah. um and because things change, right? I mean, there are people who, and that crew, it's funny, we just had dinner uh, at the Adobe Summit a couple nights ago, and uh, we kind of put together this sort of digital OG uh, dinner from some of the people that, that kind of came up together 10 years ago or so, uh, 10, 12 years ago. So a lot of old friends. And we actually talked about this at dinner. Like, did you think that you would be able to sort of make a career out of this? And then everybody's like, yeah, not really. I mean, we were kind of hoping, but no. And it's funny because there are some people, uh, it doesn't matter who, but some people who were um, kind of quote unquote, I guess, name brands or whatever you would say uh, in social and digital then that, that for whatever reason lost their passion or lost their way or ended up doing something else. It's a hard job, right? I mean, you, you, you know, to, to kind of to create as many stories as I create um, every week, you know, and do it for 12 years is it, I'm not going to lie. Like it's, it's friggin' exhausting. Uh, thank God I have an amazing team at Convince to Convert that does most of the hard work because uh, there's no way I'd still be doing it. I would have quit a long time ago um, <laughs> for real, man. So, so it's, and a lot of people just said, nah, I don't want to keep doing that. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to have, um, I don't want to have to be required to tell stories as part of my job. And so a lot of folks kind of peeled off. And so to some degree, some of those people who kind of came up at the same time as I did, we sort of feel like the last of the Mohicans, right? <laughs> because now there's this giant other group of incredibly much more talented people. Uh, Brian Fanzo, Amy Landino, Sonny, Sonny Leonard Doozy. Uh, there's like all these people who, who are younger than I am and came to this maybe a little bit more recently who are so much better. Uh, than than I am or, or any of my contemporaries in a lot of ways, just because they're super comfortable with uh, with the technology and and more innately comfortable with video. So uh, no, certainly did not uh, did not know it would work out like this, but not complaining. Absolutely, and it's fun to hear everybody's stories. As you know, somebody who's kind of on the again, on the outskirts, hearing the admiration for each other rather than the competition. Oh man, I tell you what, rich rich with friends is the is the kind of rich you want to be, and right. and that's. Uh, of all the things that I'm thankful for, that is, uh, other than my family, at the top of the list, my team and my friends, because, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, and, and the nice thing about that community, because we all feel like we sort of hit the lottery, is that everybody's super um, 
just super willing to share, right? You know, it's, I think that's true in a lot of social media contexts and digital and really among storytellers, like storytellers know what it's like to tell stories. And my observation is that they're, they're disproportionately willing to share, even if they're direct competitors. I mean, Scott Stratton and I are, are truly direct competitors. I mean, a lot of cases I'll give a speech, he'll give it next year or vice versa. Right. So we are, Absolutely, um, direct competitors. Uh, Andrew Davis too, and a lot of other people. Mark Schaefer, and uh, and and yet they're you know some of my closest friends. And that's one of the things that when I first started speaking, that really attracted me to be a professional speaker because that community is amazing. I mean, number one, it's a lot of enthusiastic folks, right? You don't get a lot of like you know a holes as professional speakers. <laughs> some for sure. Don't get me wrong, but they're all pretty pretty happy go lucky folks. I mean, it's kind of a personality um, trait that that you know works in that industry. Uh, but, but I've never seen a community that was so gracious and willing to support and teach um, somebody who I really had no idea what they were doing uh, like me. So um, it's been, uh, it's been great. That's awesome. And, and I heard you say something a minute ago that kind of, kind of makes me think about what we tell our young people. Mm. We so often hear, find your passion and do it and you'll just, you know, be successful. But what I heard you say is people lose that passion. They take something that they love and they do it as a job and they go, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. Is, I mean, is there a danger to that? If I love to write and I have, and then I have to be, have to write to get paid, does yes. it lose its luster? How do you, how do you battle that? How do you balance uh, that? I guess. I mean, I don't know that there's a trick to that. I think it's to some degree sort of your own um, desires and how you're wired. But the best advice I ever got on that is very simple, but it's very true. And I'm guilty of violating this probably twice a week. Um, but I try to keep it in mind. And, and the guy's name is Paul John. He was a creative director. The first ad agency I ever worked at as an intern when I was just a kid. I was 18. And he said, never forget um, that what you do is not who you are. And that's really good advice. Because uh, you got to be able to say, um, you know, I'm not a speaker. I'm not a consultant. I'm not a writer. I'm not a podcaster. Uh, I'm Jay, who's a, a husband and a dad and a friend. And then there's some other stuff that I do so I can pay the bills. But when you start to think that your job embodies you, that's when you get worn down, right? And so that's when I get frustrated and want to quit. It's because I, I, I have commingled those things too much. And then I'm like, stop, remember what Paul told you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that helps a lot. It's got to be hard working for a boss like yours, huh? No, just kidding. It's gonna be, yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get some of, my, uh, some of my team members on the show and we'll, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, man, this is incredible, Jay. I, this has been absolutely inspiring. I appreciate your time. I'm going to get to my last question here in a second, okay. but I want to, I want to make sure everybody can, has a chance to get in touch with you. What's, I mean, the best place to, to find Jay Bear is. Lots of places. Uh, the new stuff is at talktriggers.com. Uh, all kinds of free resources there about word of mouth strategy, how to build your business with uh, your customers, becoming volunteer marketers, all kinds of, uh, of goodies there. You, links to the book, of course, but a ton of awesome stuff we'll just give you uh, for free. Yeah. Uh, the, the new show is Talk Triggers Show, uh, plural. That's, that goes right to the YouTube playlist. You can also find it as a podcast anywhere you get your audio. Just search Talk Triggers and, uh, and you'll find it. Uh, our main site where we've got 5,300 uh, articles for storytellers, business owners, managers, um, and many hundreds of podcasts uh, is at convinceandconvert.com. Perfect. We'll put those links in the show notes. Thanks, bud. So Jay, if, if somebody said to you tomorrow, all right, man, you're all done telling stories. You got to find something else to do. How would you want to go out? What would be your last story? Oh, my last story. Um, I got a lot of weird, weird stories, um, from when I'm a, I, I feel like stories follow me around, uh, somehow I just have a colorful life, not on purpose, just works out that way. Uh, I got to get better at telling my own stories on stage. I'm better at telling case studies than in my own stories. I'm trying to work on that with my coach. Uh, that's the thing I want. I've got a lot of coaches. Like I spent a ton of money on coaches and I, I'm becoming a better storyteller. Uh, a lot I have a lot of time and a lot of money and it's definitely worth it. Um, you know, the last story I would tell, um, would probably be about my brother and I, uh, my brother passed when he was 40 and, uh, like a lot of brothers, we had a, we had sort of a contentious relationship at times, you know, we were fairly close together in age. Uh, and it's a funny one. It's, it's maybe not funny to everybody, but it's funny to me. And I like to tell it because it makes me remember him and in those days. 
uh, when I was about, actually, I've got it right here. This is not the right age, but this is a picture of my brother and I oh. when we were little tiny kids. Uh, yes. He's the little one. Uh, and uh, we were older than this. I think we were maybe, uh, I was probably seven or eight, and he was four or five. I think my mom would confirm this. It was Thanksgiving. And my parents had some uh, friends, friends over to the house for Thanksgiving and then my brother and I. And, you know, Thanksgiving is so boring for kids uh, unless there's other kids there because you know, it takes yeah. forever to cook and you're like, whatever. You know, I was too young and so was he to like be, you know, let me watch a whole football game or whatever. So my, my, as my mom tells it, you know, they're cooking away, you know, whipping the potatoes or whatever. Looks out the front window and my brother and I are in the yard uh, having a rake versus hoe fight. So I had a hoe and he had a rake and we're just swinging at each other. People are bleeding. Uh, and so they had to rush out there and save us from each other and, you know, bandage us up and all that. So <laughs> I like that one a lot because uh, it reminds me of uh, being a kid with my brother. Awesome. I appreciate you sharing that story with us, man. I I've never told that one before ever. That's funny. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. I, yeah. I have a, my brother's six years younger. So we have, we have similar, I, I, I once had a, a hockey stick, I told him to stand still and I swung that as hard as I could right in front of his nose and missed him by maybe a quarter of an inch. I don't know what the <laughs> hell I was thinking, man, but I could have killed my brother. It's a very yeah. accurate, uh, very accurate slap shot. Yeah, and we, and we were on skates. Like I'm, oh, that was God. stupid. On skates even worse. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so yeah, bro- yeah, brothers are awesome. Nice. Well, Jay, thanks for your time today, man. I appreciate yeah, it very man. much. Storytellers need to go get that talk triggers, man. Get that free stuff. Your site is, is awesome. So thanks. Thanks Dan. I appreciate you. Well, there you have it. Talk triggers. Go get it. Seriously. Whether you are in a business whether you are just a personal brand, figuring out your talk trigger to create word of mouth marketing and be remarkable, absolutely incredible. Uh, Jay and Daniel have some amazing stories in this book. It's, it's a, a pretty quick read, I would say, but a lot of great stuff in it. Um, if, I didn't want to put it down. That's why it was quick. I just kept reading it every single day. So go buy Talk Triggers uh, or go to talktriggers.com, which is linked in the show notes. You can find all those links there. I guess some of the free stuff too great resources there to help you do what they, what they talk about. So, uh, and while you're at the show notes at the storytellers network.com, certainly go to the resources page, check out what's there on how to tell a better story, things from like Donald Miller, uh, from, <clears throat> from HubSpot, that kind of stuff. So, uh, it's, it's definitely more than just me. So there you go. The storytellers network is all about helping you and inspiring you as well. So, and on the storytellers network.com, you can find past episodes and ways to share this episode as well. So appreciate you listening until next time. Here's the telling stories, having stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.